there's obviously no live sport going on at the moment, but um, there's still plenty to talk about. So much has happened over the years. And Kieran Shannon, who of course writes for the Examiner and previously for the Sunday Tribune, he joins me. Uh, Twenty-five years a journalist at this stage, Kieran Shannon. Can you talk to me, like, I mean, looking back over some of the articles that you've done over the years, it's kind of like you know when you ask a player, do you ever think about the medals you've won? And it's more like you sit down at the end of the career and then you sort of appraise the situation. That's what they always say. We're kind of in this period where it's tough to write fresh stuff. So when you look back over the articles that you've done and the interviews you've done, and you've had a couple of days to think about this, is there any article or interview that kind of moved you more than others? Well, um, there, there, there've been a lot um, through the years, uh, as you know, as you said, I've been doing it for twenty-five years, and I suppose just as you said, between a, a period like this, and I suppose I'm not. We're going to be self-isolating, and I suppose whatever interviews I do over the next while will be like this, as opposed to 98% of the interviews I do are in person, particularly since I did that. I've been doing the big interview slot with the examiner. When when you say that, uh, no, there's there's so many. I mean, because it's not like an All Ireland or an All Ireland final, like because you're doing this every week or every, you know two out of every three weeks at least. But when you ask me that um, about articles that move me um well look i i'd have to start with someone who's been hugely important i guess um like i've i've as well as i've been writing the interviews i've been do, I've, I've i've done books with uh, at least four j i've ghosted four j autobiographies and one of them would be mickey hart and as well as i've gone through the range with mickey um like i first met him the week that he got the tyrone job in 2002 and we hit it off fairly well to the point i told him to keep a diary um when um in the in in the off chance that Tyrone won the All Ireland, I had been reading Alex Ferguson's books with Peter Ball where he kept diaries of those, you know, those first few years where United uh, made the breakthrough. And I thought that I just I thought that that template could apply to Jay and uh, Hart kept a video or an audio diary and then when they won it, um uh, we filled in the gaps through a series of interviews and, and turned around a book for that Christmas. And so they were happy times, but then um, March the 2nd, 2004, Cormac Mac and Allen died, suddenly, prematurely, tragically. And uh, I found myself back in the Hart living room uh, that I had spent uh, a lot of time in the previous autumn uh, doing the book, and which had been obviously celebrating their success, as challenging it had been through the years. And then all of a sudden, because Cormac was... Mickey Hart's right hand man. He 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 was Hart on the field, and to hear um, I, uh, Mark Hart was there, who had played with Cormac on those minor and under twenty one teams and was on the panel in 03 and still that time in 04. Michaela, who famously wrote, so to hear them open up and bounce off each other, all anecdotes. There was a lot of like you get it. It was it was awake. I mean, I'd been up in the family house in the Macanellans, but this was. A format where you're telling yarns, reminiscing, and then you know there was tears shed in front of me there, and then uh, little did I know that seven years later I'd be back in that lit house. Um, uh, I was there at the wake, and I, I I was I was there as someone close to the family um, as well in that time where it was just family only, and it was just devastating. And um, I would have interviewed Mickey. Um, I would have spoken to Mickey around that time. That was a terrible, terrible week. And then I would have, um, when they had the match for McKella about 18 months later, where was it Donegal played the rest of Ulster at the end of 2012, um, where he spoke so eloquently about McKella's, um, the, you know, he talked about, you know, every time I open the door, I feel like there's something missing. I, I, I know there's something missing. And about, about how much he loved going into her room and how he talked about what her, she always spoke about God always having a plan and that in this warped way, this might be part of God's plan and about how it's beyond human comprehension, but there's something in it and about how he wasn't angry with his God, that God, he was, he, you know, God had still, they were in credit because of the 27 years God had given them Michaela. Um, so when you ask me about you know what's moved me, um, I suppose th you know that they were just like I remember being at 
Nikella's um, wake, Father Jared McAleer, who had been um, one of Mickey's selectors, uh, particularly in 03 and with the underage teams, I remember him saying, why, do, why does my Lord keep taking away our young people? Because uh, Cormac McAnellan and Michaela Hart were two exceptionally good, God-loving, God-fearing people. And uh, when you ask me what's moved me, I mean, that's where I'll go straight, you know, is Tyrone. I suppose I've seen a lot in Tyrone. They were, as you mentioned, Shane, we would have been colleagues in the Tribune, and I suppose a formative period in my career would have been following the Tyrone and Armagh story when I was the guy car for, for the Tribune. And, the, and um, you know, I remember just before the 2003 All-Ireland um, interviewing Frank McGuigan, who had been kind of um, obviously a cult figure uh, in the mid-'80s. Uh, but then through injury, you know, car accident and, and alcoholism battle, um, slipped from slipped from the public view until, you know, his son Brian was featuring in the Tyrone 2003 team. And I, I was talking to a group of uh, sports journalist students in UL last month, and I was making the point that sometimes it's rarely happened in my career, but it, it happened here where I've, I went up to meet Frank in Ardbo on a Monday and whatever way it was, we got the times mixed up or Frank was heading out the door maybe to coach a team. And we could have just done, I could have used what was in the 15 minutes and uh, done it over the phone. But I knew, no, I have to go again. And the way it was in the Tribune, I remember not charging. I, I didn't even, you know, I had to go up there a second time. I didn't charge for expenses the second time. I just knew there's something here. And I have to say that interview I did with Frank McGuigan and to hear him open up about his struggles and... The, t the situations he ended up in and what he put his family through, um, that was another memorable piece. That that piece moved me. Um, but I remember just, I don't think I've ever been in a zone with a person. I'd like to think whenever I do an interview, I'm right in the now with them. But I remember just being there with Frank and um, he was so open. And uh, that piece was uh, hugely, like our ma people when the, the right were, were on about just how much they loved that piece because... Um, it, it was uh, reminding them of a, a great figure uh, from the early 80s, but also just his, um, and, and, you know, that he was coming on the right side of it now, you know, uh, when he gave that. So that that's another piece that moved me. Because as you're talking about that, it reminds me of the feeling, the chills down your spine that, that can come when you do a particularly moving interview. Two that, that stick, three that stick out to me is number one, the, the interview about Niall Donoghue, the, the um, Galway hurler who committed suicide mm. in late 2013. So did a piece with uh, with his brother Shane, his dad Francie, who David Burke, Justin Fahey, um, Conor Whelan, Whelan, think, Whelan, uh, Whelan, of course, as well, who was a great part of it. But um, I remember showing up because a couple of journalists had been on uh, onto Davy Burke trying to set this up. So we agreed to meet in the Loch Ray Hotel. But as I showed up... Um, I thought it was just going to be Conor Whelan um, and possibly Shane, uh, who would have been Niall's brother. But then all of a sudden there was an older man there and I was just told, oh, that's, um, that's Niall Donahue's dad. And I kind of, it threw me off a little bit because, you know, a lot of the times in these situations, you can be dealing with very, very sensitive issues. And when I was told, oh, this is Francie, my mind went blank for a second and I said, Niall, is it? And, you know, I said the, wrong, I said the name of his son to him. But he was, he was unbelievably nice, kind, great, very giving. And I suppose he would have, in the four years between his son's passing and this interview, he would have spoken to an awful lot of people. So he, he was very good at dealing with people. But I remember throughout the whole interview, and it was, like it turned out brilliantly, but in, in terms of like getting the message across to people and the importance of talking and all this kind of stuff that's so important, just the whole sensation of you just don't want to let the air out of the balloon here because you have people probably talking in a way that they never spoke before. Um, Shane Donahue, he said to his dad at one stage, as his dad was kind of relating his feelings, I never heard you say that before. And you had that a couple of times and it was just, mm -hmm. it was kind of, a, um, it was it was such a, a privilege to be there for it. But throughout the whole time, you're terrified that you're going to say the wrong thing that's going to let the air out of the balloon. That's something I also uh, um, noticed in the piece about OMAD, the, the bombing 20 years on, another piece I did for with Off the Ball. 
and uh, oh, just, yeah, 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 okay. And these people are just so giving and so like talked so openly about something that's so tragic. And I, I'm just amazed by people's ability to do this on camera. Like Niall mm-hmm. O'Mara, who Tipperary wing forward, his brother committed suicide when he was a, a much younger lad, also. And you know, I was relating to him about what it's like to lose a sibling, having lost my sister last year. And uh, just the way that people can t- can talk about these mm-hmm. things. I just it's so so moving and uh, like do, do you do you get that sensation of sort of chills down your spine as people are talking about these things yeah um like it's interesting you say that about you know the the piece about the, the various relatives and friends of Niall that you spoke to at the time I remember because as you said it, you know they, they, it was four years later when they did that timing is important um uh, an interview that stands with me is interviewing Noel O'Leary, the ferocious, tenacious warrior like uh, Cork Wingback, um, team of the noughties in 2010. Uh, Noel was someone whose career um, I had been following from when he won an All-Ireland minor in 2000. I remember we used to, in the Tribune, predict an All-Star team for five years' time, and I remember having Noli penciled in in 05, for 05, so, and yet he didn't make his debut till about 03, 04, uh, but I I think he knew I, I, I was an admirer, and we'd have, um, so he was someone I was cultivating through the years, um, but not because of that, not because I, I, I then became aware of the tragedy that had befa- befallen his family, and um and I remember, like, let's say, I think in years like 06, I might have said, Noel, you know, like I was a Sunday Tribune writer looking for a Sunday piece and um, might say, Noel, um, is there a chance of doing a piece with you? And, you know, they were hard to sometimes get, right? But you'd usually get someone. I remember Noel saying, no, the, the time's just not right yet, Kieran. The time's just not right. And then um, I got him before the 2007 All-Ireland semi-final um, before Meath. And um, we met in the Silver Springs Hotel where I've conducted a lot of interviews through the years. And the lad, to be credit, goes back to what you were saying, when the time's right, but then when the time, when they were ready to talk, God, he talked. And it was extremely moving whereby he had a lot of tragedy between a cousin dying, a friend dying, um, he's in the tree surgery game, and then he had a brother who died just a few months, a lot of this was uh, just either side of him winning that uh, 2000 All-Ireland minor title. And it was at a time when people didn't talk about these things, you know, like one of the great things how Irish society has changed, where there's less of a stigma about this. So that moved me. And then, you know, um, six years later, you know, you were talking about Niall's death, like what that triggered was um, Connor Cusack writing his blog and... Connor um, then went on prime time, and I caught Connor just um, a few days either side of Christmas of 2013, just a few weeks after Niall's passing. And you know, you're talking about um, how you feel and those chills you get. I've interviewed Connor a couple of times because he's the most, <laughs> for someone who's done alone, Cusick's brother, he's the most eloquent person in that house and I've probably ever met and one of the most compassionate and empathetic human beings I've had because of the struggle he's had and some of the stories he talked about hiding away from the world and how he's helped people out of that room himself through the years um, is um, you're asking, you know, moving moments because look, yeah, like because of I, I'm, I'm fortunate where often I'm in I get these people at a time in an environment where they're willing to speak and there's no time limit. Um, you know, an interview can go for an hour and a half, two and a half hours. And as you say, when when they are giving off themselves, um, it's a privilege what we have. You mentioned that was the word that struck you about being there because um, and and yeah like i've i've had when i go through the interviews i've had uh, people uh, i think another one i mentioned connor there was uh tommy gilfoyle i remember him talking and, and like you interviewed richie dennis there i've only read the first chapter off the book but you went straight into it you you caught him there on the gaelic runs a week or two ago and um how we never know what's going on do you remember like was it joe joe malloy did a piece there with david myler about um 
him playing a, a game for Ireland and was it his wife was having a miscarriage and um, you know that um, Richie went into the 73 All-Ireland with his child very sick at the time. Um, Tommy Gilfoyle would have been a warrior with Clare in the lean years. Um, came back out of retirement in 94. Uh, got the two goals against Tip to knock out the league champions and Munster champions. And then um, in the week leading into the uh, Munster final against Limerick, um, Started the summer of 95 and I knew how that summer was tough for him because it was the following summer and it was his first year not being involved with a Clare team in 14 years and that was obviously the year and um, you know that like when you yeah like and like Tommy Gilfoyle talking openly years later about what actually no one knew in going to that Munster final and I'm sure he was abused and as he said I got a goal when it didn't matter a shit Um. But that's what Tommy Gilfoyle was going through that time and beyond it, um, you know. Um, but yet, the same interview moved me in different ways because he's got a great sense of humour and perspective. And when you talk about being move, moving, you know, there's different ways of moving. There's where you're, you're, you're nearly biting the lip yourself and I've seen people cry in front of me. And then, I, I you know, you're nearly crying with laughter with some of the interviews uh, that you have and with, Tommy got the Tommy Gilfoyle interview when we went through the gambit of emotions uh, that day down in um, the the Castle Cafe down here in Clare Castle. I remember interviewing Ross King. It was only a few months ago. People will know him from the Leash Hurling team, and uh, he did a brilliant interview the year before with Shane Keegan, where he was talking about getting his teeth knocked out in that yes. county final and all that kind of terrible stuff. But then I did an interview with him, just a bit of a, a career sort of an interview, and we spoke for I think forty minutes. My cheeks were sore at the end of it. He's just such a funny guy. He was talking about being this country lad and going up to UCD to play soccer and hurling. And people were talking about him. You know, the, he was talking about the guys in the soccer dressing room with all their hair done right. And he was saying he kind of half thought they'd probably have shaved arses the way they had themselves turned out. And they were asking him, what's he doing coming in with gas shorts? And he was like, what are gas shorts? He didn't even understand the term. So I have to say he's one of the funniest guys. Are, are there any particularly funny interviews? Ah, uh, well, yeah, look, there's been... I mean, one that stands out, and you're, you're on about that, the, the, the humour, because, you know, it can come across as very po-faced, the stereotype, like, I, as I said, I've been doing this for 25 years, and your access to them is different to the point where I don't really interview players, um, you know, the week leading into a big game, I, I tend to get past players or past managers or whatever who uh, can speak more freely. Um, and I suppose because of that, um, I got him, Mickey Conroy was someone who I knew because, as you know, I, I would have uh, helped teams out for a, a period there um, in the last decade. And Mickey Conroy with Mayo Football was someone who I knew. And, and in that time, while well, I was in the dressing room, still doing, you know, interviews. It would be all these players are so austere now and but when you were in that dressing room you knew that the characters are as great as ever you mentioned the likes of Ross and Conroy was I mean people wonder how Mayo keep going it's because of people like that in the dressing room like you know and even like I, I, like I remember being at Mickey's table after we lost was it the 2013 All-Ireland and he, like he got me through that day. We were, uh, Donny Vaughan, I remember being beside me, Alan Dillon, and Conroy just kept us going with, I think Mickey had yet to meet his wife at the time and, uh, you know, a, a date that he had had and it just had us in stitches. So when Mickey uh, finished up, I think in 2016, so I got him before the 2017 All-Ireland semi-final against Kerry and he opened up a boat uh, I suppose the two parts off Mickey. There was the Mickey. Mickey played in an All Ireland final, scored a goal in, in in his debut. The first ball he ever kicked in inter county senior in the county football was a goal in the All Ireland. But it was it was when they had been routed by Kerry. Um, but he, he and his wild years in the from 04 to 07 was was cut after the league final in 07, and then had five years in the wilderness uh, before coming back. But in terms of um, the way the yarns and the good times that you have been involved in this um, 
inter county and beyond um like he he the the tales that he had and the self deprecating humor um it was just priceless and like that interview got a huge reaction because um he got that like the the famous one where um right he came back with you know more gear you know he he, he was a new man etc but he talked about in 2012 um the boys had had a game up in Bally Shannon um uh, was a belly bow against um against Donegal in the league and how the boys had gone out and um how one of the lads uh, uh Richie Feeney confided to the Monday um drink club you know and how Tommy had been on or Mickey had been on but he had um he, you know he he knew how not to as he said never admit to the double spill you know you know first rule of Monday Monday drink club is there is no Monday drink club and um Tommy or Mickey, Mickey, I think uh, described. You're on about the humor, um, like I think you're 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 setting maybe a link to a couple of these pieces, but like, you know, it, it's it, like um, I remember interviewing Benny Tierney. Uh, Benny had uh, Benny was still a selector in 08. Benny had come back to be a selector in 08. So I remember interviewing Benny before I think they were playing. Uh, was it down that year? or Kevin, and I got him, and for four hours in his um, patio, um, just laughing, story after story, because again, Armagh would have been seen to be, you know, the what's that, uh, Easter Island, you know, the McGinnies, just the serious looking fellas between the McGinnies and the McNulties, etc., but that, that, that dressing room had great laughter and characters as well, and and um so yeah uh, humor is very important and um, like even going back to the point we were making like i was mentioning about tommy gilfoy another one there that uh has kind of made the greatest hits um is joe quaid uh great man jo joe actually again like uh i, I suppose i i've interviewed joe tw now twice face to face but actually the first time i got joe and we were making this point off air at the start was how you could sometimes get these guys the week of um Back in the day, you could get these guys the week off a big match. So let's say when uh, Limerick were playing Tip in '97, which, as you remember, like was uh, a, that was a do or die game. The Munster final itself wasn't. Uh, that was the first backdoor. But for Limerick, who had won Munster the previous year against Tip, who were obviously gunning, um, so that this was the do or die, forty-five thousand in Turles. Uh, I got Joe Quaid on the phone. Um, and this was just after Joe had the famous accident. <laughs> and even then he was telling the stories. And uh, 15 years later, I met him again in 2012. And he was in All-Irelands, even though he won All-Stars both those years, I think. And uh, and, and then obviously he, he lost a, a testicle um, after getting a, a, a save and a shot. And his humour about that, um, I and yet talking about the like I one of the going back to the Tommy Gilfoyle, how tough the uh, ninety five was for him. Um, I got Joe again uh, before the McDonough Cup final last year, and again laced with great humour. But he had lost a sister, and he spoke so eloquently about the mixed emotions about. Uh, how he w he was wondering how he would feel when Limerick won the All Ireland, and he talked about how he had to turn back. He could not watch Joe Canning's free. He just could not watch it. And uh, but then how much he found that there was no bitterness. There was not that could have been us. Or he was just so delighted as a Limerick man. And obviously he Joe had played his part in. Um, with uh, involved with development squads, the Forestals um, and under 15s beyond. He he had those boys for years, and where they had tragedy, you know, like um, where they lost a couple of boys along the way and dealing with funerals. They had their own Paul McGurr moments. Um, so the range, the gambit again. Joe's one of those guys who's just a gem, you know. Like I go back to. Um, you know what? When I when I go through, you know, I've been doing the big interview for the Examiner for nine years, and I go through the list of people I've met. I I haven't met a dull person in this, you know. But Joe, Joe stands out. Yeah, 
He sure does. Have well, what's, one, what's one for you that you've that, that you've seen humor? No, uh, that, that you mentioned Ross, right? Um, or where you've had the range, like. Um, yeah, I, like it's a tough thing, isn't it, to even go back over all your interviews and even try and find where they happened. And it's just about the next one, isn't it? The editors, it's, it's, just, it's about the next one. It's the next one. You don't like, we, and that cliche where we 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 tend to talk to players about the past, and and they're just on to the next one. We don't we don't talk generally do this. So that was it's only when it takes something like this where you go, yeah, that was back then because you're just looking to the next one, you know. Just trying to take Joe. What I was going to ask you actually, just before we, we move on to that, have you know you've been involved with Mayo as a sports psychologist, and you were involved with Tipperary, and I was I was there thinking about as you were talking about this, I was thinking about how tough it can be to watch on. You know, having a brother playing in in like five All Ireland finals, especially twenty fourteen when the the Hawkeye free just went wide at the end. You know, mm. you're just actually roaring. You're you're in the press box, but it's so pr- unprofessional the idea of getting up and screaming and roaring. But you see it in the press box all the time. Have you ever found it particularly tough to watch people you know very well, or teams you've been involved with, or your own county while you've been in the press box? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would have been. Um, as you said, I've been. I was in. I've been in the press box, and I've been for. There was a period there where I was in the. In the Sabaro seats there, in in um, the, I suppose the equivalent of the dugouts there, um, on our learning final days, and um, when I was in the press box, you know there was a certain decorum that you'd observe. But I do remember being as a cartman. I was very happy in '99 and 2010. Um, but uh, you're asking me about how tough it is. Like I mean, just because uh, I suppose I did work with some of those teams. I was there when. Bubbles, um, you know, just watching that um, from a remove. I wasn't with the team at that point, but um, you still had a connection with uh, the likes of Eamon in particular, and uh, and that. But like, yeah, look, you just uh, like, and I've been, as I said, I've been in the dugout on All Ireland final day, and you lose by a point, and uh, you know, like, but you're you're asking how you 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 go through, it. but like, you you've you've got to have a certain element of detachment, and you're still actually optimistic, like I. I worked with Mayo, as I said, and I remember, let's say we were four points down in some games. Like I remember a league semi-final against Kerry, which was pivotal at the time in the development of the team. Cullen Boyle got a goal out of nothing and Killian knocked over a free to bring us into extra time, which we won. And I, I remember like at the end of the Donegal game, thinking we were going to still find a way. Shamey had a chance at the very end, uh, you know, a quarter chance, not even a half chance, but I thought he would do a boiler, we'd score, we'd win the kick goal. You're, you're still actually in that mode. So it's only when the whistle goes that you, um, you know, that you're in the process yourself, I guess. And then just, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it, that, that, that's how it is. It's actually when you're outside afterwards, like I would say that, my, like my wife's from Mayo, like I, I was more devastated after losing the 20 I was as devastated after 2016 and 2017 finals uh, as I was when um well it was it was in the orbit of how I felt after particularly 2013 and 2014 but um yeah like um but then um you know that that's a while ago now and um you have a certain detachment now from it all there's there's definitely interviews that stand out to me for that on-field reaction straight away, or, or even a few minutes yeah. after when they've had time to let the feelings percolate. Tommy Walsh, I think after Tullerone won their county intermediate title last year, I think plenty of people would have seen the interview. Now, Nicky Brennan got in all the questions and he had his uh, over yeah, Tommy's yeah. shoulder. I couldn't get in to actually ask a question, but uh, yeah. I think the best thing to do was let the two of them off because that was brilliant, sort of. that that To a lot of people, that summed up the passion of the GA, the way Tommy reacted. Mm. Then the flip side was... Strange to think that a league game could do this, but 2014, Watford had started well against Dublin in a league relegation match. They ended up losing it. And being in a, you've been in Walsh Park and Watford many times, I'm sure. And going into the, the dressing room afterwards, these, this cold, dank, drab, sort of concrete-laden dressing room that Derek McGrath was in his first season, just gotten relegated. And I remember just feeling the disappointment of him. You know, you'd seen people being angry, you'd seen people being upset. You know, you, 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 you brought me back to a previous lifetime, Shane, uh, because I, I haven't really, I would still occasionally, it's rare enough, right? But we had extraordinary access, as much as we'd have bitched about it, you know, like because it was a bit ad hoc. 
whereby let's say after a big match so I would have been doing a lot of post-match quotes when I was started in my first bout with the examiner from 96 to 98 right so in those years so you could be waiting an hour and a half outside and then they let you in or you could you might be let in and there's just two people left right or you could be in there straight after the game right we we like, I remember being in the Tipperary dressing room in 96 after they lost the Monster Final replay. And, like, I, I, like it, it was extraordinary. Like, like, looking back, no, there is no way a Jim Gavin or a Desi Farrell or any of those would give the media the access. But that's how it was at the time. And I remember being in that danky little room in, um, in Parky Cueve and the devastation, looking at Georgie Friend, Ramey Ryan, it was Nicky and Pat Fox's last time being in a tip dressing room. The devastation. The devastation. Like it was and later that year, I remember being in the tip dressing room after the last in ninety seven and you had a relationship with some of the players. I remember talking to Michael Ryan about, you know, David Ford. What what was the detail? Because, you know, he, he was playing between the lines, if you remember that. And having that chat. I remember seeing Christy and James E. O'Connor on the other side just embracing like brothers, which they were. Um, but the de I remember being in the, you're on about getting that moment and one of the most charismatic teams are the, when I think of all, I mentioned Tyrone Armagh right up there as a group to deal with was Wexford 96 were exceptional. And, um, I remember getting Billy Byrne and, um, George O'Connor in that dressing room afterwards. It was just unbelievable, you know, like, cause how George O'Connor and you're on about that moment, the famous moment, the image of that game is George dropping to his knees, the, the famous um, prayer to God moment. And, and I remember him talking about that and how he had got the lay call after Shawnee flood, uh, Billy Byrne, who I remember Griffin saying that if they were to win, what it would mean, because we were talking about the likes of even Tommy Gilfoy, these people who put their, reputation on the line and we don't know what's going on and because they didn't get over the line the abuse they can take from within the own county as well as outside it and how it would mean so to and he said like that they can walk down the street no and that they've done it and and the people of wexford will see them as the heroes they always were and to catch the two of them talking about that at that moment so when i think of my interview i don't tend to think of those ones but now you've triggered it like that was an amazing um, that was an amazing thing to see. Actually, um, something, something that comes to mind then is sometimes you pick up these nuggets that you would never expect from interviews. And I, I'm not asking you to pull something out of thin air there. But I, I interviewed, was it, I think John Mohan when he was over Laherdon, the, the Mayo Club. It must have been about a year and a half ago. Turned out that Laherdon, that area, was the highest percentage, I think, per capita of a town Titanic, of people that killed in the Titanic. Just amazing stuff that you'd come across. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I don't expect that to come off the top of your head there. But uh, it, it can be amazing, the stuff that you just come across like that. Yeah, no, without doubt. I mean, because, look, it's the old line, and it, it goes for articles as much as, um, you know, particularly books. Like, I remember Mick Foley, when I was starting to do uh, a basketball book called Hanging from the Rafters about basketball, particularly in the 80s, and I remember him saying, like, you know, that the best books, a lot of them are America. He says they he says, they, they don't tell you so much about sport, they tell you about America, you know. Um, so, Rafters, I was trying to tell the story of Ireland in the 80s through basketball, a bit like the Boys in Green documentary that's been shown at the moment. And and in that, that goes, though, for good articles, you know. They tell you something about, because what you're doing is, like, particularly with the big interview slot that I do, it's a Saturday read. Tony Lean and the boys have given me great scope there. I can, I can hit 3,000 words easily with it. Um, but I'm trying to bring in people who... And maybe, you know, I write about Nanga or when I'm writing about it as much as there's a certain, I suppose, specialist knowledge of, of Jay, you're trying to bring in the more casual reader and you do that through, as you said, like, like everyone knows about the Titanic. Um, like Laherdon is, is is very close to where my wife's from, and uh, yeah, like you wouldn't know that kind of stuff. I mean, um, like even now, I mean, what triggered this was we were talking about the coronavirus, and it brought us back to looking back at, um, you know, the the Spanish flu and uh, 
the War of Independence when the GA Championship was disrupted and uh, like there was a piece there at the weekend about an All-Ireland winner who, who died with the Spanish flu. Like there's all these sort of, there's more to sport than sport, you know. There's more to hurling than hurling. There's more to football than football. And um, it's getting, uh, it, it, it's getting that. And when you get the, um, like people in their, um, in their place, like I mean, um one of the best interviews, Kieran McDonald did give some interviews, right? And I was fortunate to get to one of them. And I'll explain that one maybe in a bit. But the best interview I ever saw by on McDonald, actually, which was, I think it was, it was with one of the local Mayo papers, I think the Western uh, people. Um, and he talked about uh, laying pipe, you know, like... Uh, like you talk about goal setting, and and there was a nice piece about uh, McDonald um, about how he set up shooting, and the likes of Stevie McDonald and Canavan were watching him. And I saw that when I did interview him, which I'll come to in a bit. But like, how McDonald applied, um, like he was a savage worker, you know. He um, he, he was uh, he was in the business of laying down pipe um, himself and his father. He was working for his father, I think, and. Um, you know, like in different parts of the country, like really hard physical work and the, how actually methodical he was about doing that. That gave you an insight. Like the, the the best one then, like one of the best interviews and when I think of that period, um, you know, you're talking about, um, we're talking about Armand Tyrone, but obviously Kerry were a constant in that time too. And um, like they had some, when, when they opened up post-party, uh, there was some great characters, and, and and there's you know Canada was was an exceptional um, interview subject, you know where he opened up to him and Sweeney talking about most of the article was about films, particularly French films, you know. There's the, uh, when you get them actually talking about something outside their like one of the best um, interview subjects as well that I've come across through the years um, is Tony Brown, with Waterford, and Tony. Tony talking about fishing, you know, like that was his, instead of going pinting, he might go for a few pints this Sunday after winning a big game in Munster. Up to me first about the Venga bus, the famous Venga bus uh, back in the pillar years uh, where they'd be on the piss on the Monday and some of the jinx they got up to and, uh, but, and, and going into coppers in their pajamas, etc. But Tony, Tony Brown preferred to be in the black water fishing that was his little reward for himself that was his little refuge and hearing tony brown talk about the salmon and the journey of the salmon and comparing it to the intercounty player's career or a season for him and about making sure that he was fresh you know because like tony's longevity is only match uh, on ao chun by ring you know like uh, like Tony played from 92 to 2013. Incredible. How did he do that? And he explained it through an analogy through um, fishing. That, that was another extraordinary interview. Um, not, not to cut across you on that, but yeah. as soon as you mentioned Tony, I did, um, it was like one of these live panel shows once uh, for a bank down in, was it down in Ballygunner or somewhere like that? It, it was down in Waterford. And he was talking about his longevity. And he said when he hit around 30, he saw Ryan Giggs talking about how he wanted to prolong his career. You know, the way he'd had all, all the hamstring injuries and, and so on and so forth. And he said he obviously got into the bit of yoga and that Tony himself then decided to get into the same thing. And that obviously would have been key to his longevity too. I just thought I'd say that while you brought him up. Yeah, like, like you've met him. He, he, he's a gender. I, I, like I interviewed back in those innocent years, as I said, when I was starting, but when I look back in that late 90s period when I was in the examiner, I remember like getting meeting Tony for the first time in '98 before a league semi-final. Again, the access, you know, to be fair to Gerald, who was the manager at the time, and given, um, you know, the access that we did, like, like, um, so like that that team had great characters. Um, they were they were constrained again a bit like the Kerry boys and what they could say. Let's say under Justin in particular and Davy later, but uh, some great characters and. Um, you know, and and now, now like I, when you get them that little bit later, um, you know, there's 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 brilliant stories. Like I mean, um, another interview I have here, like is is Michael Ryan, our manager, 2012. I remember getting him j just uh, before I think that Munster final that year. Did they get to the Munster final that year? Um, 
Yeah, they, they, they played tip. Yeah, they played tip. Um, tip beat them by two goals under Declan, and um, he was uh, he was um, he was again excellent. Like the, and just on that, like Michael has spoken off a lot about the ladies' football breakthrough. Like um, I have. Um, like everyone else, you know, you're 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 more aware now of how few women you've interviewed through the years and how you're trying to interview more, you know, from the obviously ladies football has got much bigger. One of the most extraordinary athletes I've ever encountered is Juliet Murphy. Um I remember Juliet different things after a game Ju Juliet gave a little turnover I think in the last second last few seconds and I, I remember being there beside when her coach was consoling her um, and that would have been maybe one of her first brushes dealing with media and you know 15 years later I'm interviewing her before in All-Ireland you know she's going for her six but actually what what where, she, where it was was it was after Cork had had the break they'd won the first five in a row they had lost to Tyrone and to hear Juliet Murphy talk about how they hadn't deserved it how there had been slippage people maybe not staying on that extra 20 minutes to do the physio and getting back into the car and how she walked the streets of Cork with her earphones on when the All-Ireland final was being played was a Dublin Tyrone she could not watch that All-Ireland um, the way she used to beat herself up, um, she had this little voice, this little, uh, they talk about, you know, the little self-talk that you have and how she had this little nagging self-doubt call, and she called it Misha. And she talked about her love-hate relationship with Misha, Misha through the years, how it drove her on, how it drove her mad. Um, you know, a real uh, exceptional woman, uh Champion and Downey is someone who really left an impression with me. Um, I interviewed her in the new park in Kilkenny, and her speaking about growing up um, in Kilkenny and under the shadow of her sister. Uh, like even though she was brilliant, you know, well she's not the good one, you know, people in the shop, but how she ended up being one of the best ever, obviously herself, and um, her commitment and you know. What, like, because one of the extraordinary things about women's sport and camogie and the like is that so very few women actually coach it themselves. But like, she's been involved in as a four, four or five of the last six All Irelands and won one. Um, you know, she left a huge impression on me as well. Uh, Ashley Thompson actually, after one of the All Irelands, she was she was talking about a person that she had lost in her life and explained it relative to the tattoos. That was definitely one of those ones. I think in the tunnel underneath Crow Park. And it's funny, the tunnels under Crow Park now currently is is the scene of coronavirus testing. It's just mad. Mm -hmm. I was only saying to my housemate um, today, isn't it mad the history and the ever evolving history in that particular place? Crow Park? It's seen it all, man. I mean, like, there it is. This is the 100th anniversary of, of Bloody Sunday, you know. Um, the national, obviously, one of the most, I mean, that's what this. That's what the stand, its biggest stand, is named after what happened there. And a um, hundred years on, here we are in another national crisis. And and it is like, a, like you know, Twitter, everything's so immediate, right? And I, I was making the point in another unrelated piece to how Basketball Ireland were the first art, um, were the first sporting body to just say, look, we're pulling everything now, right? And in that following that was on a Wednesday evening, on the Thursday morning, people were, what's happening with the National League? I, I was talking to Colm Collins, who, you know, I'd know well from living here in Clare, and we were just talking about the, the imminent game against Fermanagh, or so we thought, and going through the different, continue to saying, like, they, they still haven't pulled it, like, and and then, so they were, they were quite late to the party by that extra 12 hours or whatever, but you have to say... Uh, and being a cross-border body and you know you would have heard Bradley on this morning about just okay he, he's underwhelmed a bit by what's going on here too but obviously the despair with the north the one um the one northern star that people can gravitate towards is um is the ga and as you said like with like in crow park like it was it was like seeing a scene from chernobyl though wasn't it like when you just saw that that clip of the of the different bays being set up 
but you know you have to say that um, it's there for its people and uh, and you know going back to you know the poignancy like you see like I, I, I was involved with various other sports um, I loved going to the games with the J, the J. I, I, I never stopped going but I suppose I would have stopped being actively involved in my own club at 13 I dropped out of, of playing hurling and football and um and I suppose it was only, and as much as I wrote about it, and throughout the late nine, uh, go, going to all those games, um, it was it was only when uh, Cormac Mac and Allen died, and I remember seeing Matty McLean and um, as one of the stewards as we were getting onto those buses, uh, and the way that the J community rallied, I hadn't seen anything like it before. It actually, you, you know, realised now that was an extraordinary circumstance, but in, in terms of someone. Passing how it's the J club that, that get it together, um, like as I said, I mentioned Matty McLean and, and uh, you know we were talking earlier about Michaela, like it was it was Malachi O'Rourke I remember who let myself and Mick Foley through that day, you know we we, we skipped a little bit and it was like Malachi O'Rourke is a member of Errigal, you know like he he and Mickey would have been going at it, um, you know the previous summer was um, Malachi involved with Fermanagh. But he was an Errigal man, he was a J man, and he was helping out one of their own, you know, the, the Springsteen line, which which is ironic on it, which is that we take care of our own. You've got to say the J are brilliant at taking care of their own and, and that, and, and that Crow Park, as you said, with its history, that 100 years on from Bloody Sunday, here it is uh, for, for the Irish people and its members, um, you know, in this crisis, you know. Well, another um, thing that came to mind is, you know, you were talking about the access over the years. Another thing was interviewing different people over the years and, and how they can change and or even how your perception can change. And I'll just give you one example. The first time I was ever at a pre- post-match press conference with uh, Jim McGuinness was in 2011. They had just beaten Kildare after extra time in that amazing quarterfinal at Croke Park. Kevin Cassidy with that famous point mm-hmm. to win the game. Mm-hmm. And the way he talked about his team and the development and he just went through almost game by game with this encyclopedic knowledge, a bit like Derek McGrath in the Hurling when he talks about, well, Seamus Callan scored 3-4 in this game and 1-2 in the next game. and You know, that sort of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I remember being so impressed and thinking straight away, okay, this guy is serious and this team are going to be serious. Then 2012, after the All-Ireland final, when they won, the first thing he did was more or less get journalist Declan Bogue kicked out of the room because of his involvement in that book that uh, Kevin Cassidy was involved in. And Mm -hmm. then the third interaction I had with Jim was in 2018. And he was, you know, he was in the in pursuit of this uh, soccer coaching career. And obviously things didn't go well with Charlotte Independence, but it was before that. And I remember asking him what his philosophy was. You know, because I really, you hear this all the time, that football mm. managers talking about my philosophy and all this kind of stuff, because I just wanted to figure out, having seen him turn football upside down, and that Donegal team were thrilled. Like, I know people take pot shots at them, but there were some of those games where it was so thrilling to watch, uh, especially when there was a clash of styles. It was really, really good. Mm-hmm. But, but I was trying to figure out what his style was with soccer, what his uh, philosophy was. And I found myself not getting a satisfactory answer. And my impression on him changed, perhaps unfairly, but even so, my impression changed based on the fact that I had once been so impressed at how he described the game versus now a game that was obviously newer to him in ter- at that level. Was and he being coy or he just couldn't articulate it? Or... Well, I suppose I didn't feel he was being coy. I just thought the answer was kind of vague in a way that when he was talking about Gaelic football, it was so measured and so direct. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting because, look, he... Look, um... Like it's, I, it's not I, taking no, a pot shot at him, no. It's well, just, yeah, no, because, yeah, because, look, he is one of those figures and they have their good hours and they have their bad hours too, you know, like that was, I would say, a bad hour with him uh, when it should have been his greatest hour, you know, after winning the All-Ireland, how he, how he behaved with the Declan situation. But he's, some of these guys have those little dips like, look, I mean, I don't know if we've mentioned them here, but a, a figure that casts hugely over, you know, since I've been involved, if I was to say one guy who's a similar figure to him, uh, would be Lucknan, you know, and I like there would have been times Lucknan might have maybe let himself down occasionally with some elements of the media would contend, but overall, like he was a godsend for us. I mean, when I think of uh, 
like I, I started in 95 I mentioned yeah I did mention how at the uh, how I met him the week of the Munster final 97 I remember he could get, sometimes give you the run around a little bit uh, then you know I remember getting an interview with him before um, after Cork had won the league final in 98 or had Cork beaten Limerick uh, just around that time and he gave an, an interview which would have been front page about how they were worried, um, he, he like you know, there was an element of mind games to it, but there was some great copy and honest copy in it too. And then um, I remember getting him in '98 before one of the Galway games in the quarter, or sorry, '99, and he was reflecting back on '98 and uh, he, and and like look, some some of these guys, right? Who like look, Nan was someone who uh, you're on about that kind of memory that McGuinness and Derek McGrath would have. Like back then, you know, you'd go to a press day. Let's say I remember before '97 doing um, a piece on Baker, right? And I was able to go to look Nan for ten minutes. To give it, you could do that. You know what I mean. Like whereas if you were profi- if you were profiling, Kieran Kilkenny, uh, could you call Jim or talk to Jim Gavin for ten minutes and he'll give you a nice anecdote? But it it just isn't there. Whereas the likes of Lucknan, um, was always willing to take that call to help. You know, Griffin was you know obviously a dream at that. You could just get a a brilliant um, uh, nugget uh, from them. But like um, going back to a McGuinness, I would say that. Like um, I didn't have any dealings with him as a journalist, um, but um, I remember, like I, as I said, I was involved with some of those Mayo teams, and uh, I remember Declan calling me that night, and I, he should have been consoling me. I was nearly consoling him after him being becoming a, a national uh, after that. But um, someone like uh, I remember David Walsh saying about Lucknan at the end of '98 when all it was going on, you know. Um, he he basically said that uh, you know when you have someone like look Nan they are going to get it occasionally run but we shouldn't dismiss all the good they did and like you know um, you're on about poignancy that we've experienced through the years I mean uh, we didn't get this interview but you know some of the stuff that he would have given to Keith Duggan which has led to their collaboration with the book like uh, like uh, not that I had a wish list um, but I would say that. You, you you mentioned him there, like he has to be one of the most compelling figures since you've been doing this, right, McGuinness? Like without he's one doubt, of those figures, like, like a look man, you know? Yeah, no, he, he's fantastic to listen to and like he revolutionised Gaelic football. So I'm, I'm trying to find that balance between giving an accurate reflection of how I found that interview versus, mm. you, you know, I want to make sure that it's not like I'm trying to sully his name, reputation or sort of bring you know into question yeah. what he's trying to do it's just kind of that's kind of the, yeah, but, the way I uh, felt about it. yeah look he's but uh it's funny how there's all kinds of sides to him i mean um two of the interviews again like because there's i haven't sent them the links there but some of the uh again just really good interviews that i got like happened to be like with brendan Devenny and colin parkinson um great characters in their own right, you know, and guys who knew how to party, but they could tell you Jim knew how to party too. And some of their ways of t- telling the, the stories of, uh, of Jim back in the day. Um, you know, McGuinness, as I said, I've never interviewed him, but, uh, admired him, uh, from a distance and in a way up close to having gone against some of his teams in 12 and 13. Uh, and you have to, um, you know, he, he's one of those characters that, um, like who's, you know, not, not, it's not Marmalite. There's times where you'll love them. There might be other times where you're not as impressed with them. But look, you couldn't ignore him and you've got to give it to him. And, you know, one of the best, like he's given some of the best interviews. Um, you know, as I said, those Keith Duggan pieces are some of the best pieces that have that Keith's ever done, you know. Without doubt. Just before we finish up, you've been great with your time. Is there any other piece that you, you'd like to mention before we finish up? Um, well, not really. Uh, well, look, I, I touched upon it there. Um which was Kieran McDonald's, you know, like, which was just, uh, Kieran was notoriously reticent with the media, but, um, uh, in the lead up to Cross Malina's, uh, 2001 All Ireland success, um, I interviewed him for that. And, um, you see, he has a maverick streak here. And I remember before 97 and we're on about, we can't overly romanticize the old days too. Right. Because, as much as I could have been interviewing, uh, you know, Tipperary hurlers uh, the Thursday before they played an All Ireland semi final, like I did with Michael Ryan and Aidan Ryan, uh, you know, uh, the following month I was at the Kerry Press Day uh, before the '97 All Ireland, and um, 
Kerry footballers were kicking balls over your head while you were trying to interview, get a few words with Seamus Mine and Omaris Fitz, you know, it was a farce. So you, you don't want to overly romanticise those days. Um, and the same All-Ireland final, Mayo, uh, I was at that press day and they put four or five people up, having given, I think, the media the slip before the semi-final, which I wasn't at. But um, Dermot O'Flynn had started writing for the Examiner at that, that month and I remember him going, no, I'm not happy with this. Uh, this that wasn't good enough. He says, I want the blonde fella. You know, Dermot would be more a, a hurling man than a football man, let's say. But he was intrigued by McDonald and they both, uh, you know, Dermot was uh, in his Dennis Hopper apocalypse now, bandana look years. And uh, he, um, I remember him saying, no, I'm going. And uh, he came back three and a half hours later. I might have been by the bar at that stage having written something. I got him. I got McDonald. He, he went out to Cross Malina or just beyond it. And he caught McDonald was touching a roof and Dermot had been a builder and he joined in and they, they did a bit of the, the building together or whatever. And then they sat down and he got a very good interview with some great quotes from Kieran. And I, I, I then met McDonald at a basketball game that uh, Liam McHale and Ballinan, Dora Marsh and the boys had got the band back together again for a reunion tour, won a big cup game in 2000. I was at it and I was in the bar afterwards, met McDonald and we, we, we got on well. And I just had a feeling that this isn't a guy who you're going to phone up and get the interview with. I just rocked up one day to cross my line of training and I was, he was kind of like, well, you know, well, come here, will you, will you do this? You know? And, uh, so you don't have to be today, but tomorrow. And he says, I tell you what, I'm coming back to kick ball. If you retrieve the ball for, balls for me tomorrow, I'll, I'll give you your interview. And uh, we did the interview in his car for about half an hour. And fair is fair. And um, going back to what that piece was about um, about the way McDonald and Canavan and the gooch right, looked like what a cast, like watching McDonald. I mean, they talk about, he, he looked one of the most naturally spontaneous players ever, but you talk about design, deliberate practice, where he had the ball set up along various lines, and if he didn't make seven out of eight, he started again, you know, and just, uh, and I didn't, back in the Tribune, the 1,100 words was a lot. I remember fighting to get 1,200 words for that piece to get an extra 100 words. Uh, so I didn't really describe, which I should have, just Kier McDonald kicking the ball into the night, you know, and just helping him round up the, the, the footballs at the end. That That's one that stands out, you know. That's brilliant um, stuff, Kieran. You've been very good with your time. 25 years of great sports writing, and here's, here's to many, many more. Thanks very much, Jen. All the best. Enjoy that. Thanks.